Fontaine so far has been a wild ride that was totally unexpected for me. The lore and exploration has returned me to those first moments up on Dragonspine and in Enkonomia that really struck me. They solidified my passion for theory crafting, which now extends to the entirety of the Hoyoverse. The 4.0 and 4.1 Archon quests were action-packed and still have me on the edge of my seat. But some of Fontaine's biggest lore bombs are hiding in world quests, as usual, and even a few quests that aren't marked on the map at all. Fontaine started out subtle, and I worried that I wouldn't have much to sink my teeth into until I stumbled upon something that reminded me of what made me start this long work in the first place and brought me back to my center. The intricacies and many layers of the secrets of this world. Before I continue, I will give my blanket spoiler warning that covers almost all of the 4.0 world quests and the 4.1 Archon quest, so if you haven't played through those yet, be warned. Remember, my preferred method of theory crafting is primarily presenting information and explaining the connections I've drawn through that information, be it in visual design, writing themes, or straight up lore continuity. I hope I can, rather than trying to prove or champion any one theory, just give you new things to think about. This is the first time in a long time I've been so shook up by something I just randomly wandered into in Genshin, so of course I had to go full video game archaeologist mode on it. What I uncovered after days of piecing together scattered lore and in-game pages brought me around to some new theories and kept me sleepless for days puzzling it all out. The facts uncovered in the waters of Fontaine have turned our world upside down again, or at least tilted it over. Let's return back to the excitement of our first encounter with the unified civilization in Enkonomia and finding that same architecture in other places of the world. I'm the humble scribe of the Hexen Zirkel, Ganymede, making a triumphant return, and today I'll be your guide to the Hidden World quest, the Book of Esoteric Revelations, as well as its ties to other quests and how it subtly expands everything we know about prehistory to that. The Book of Esoteric Revelations This quest is found in Merisi Village, home of the undeniably adorable Melusine. To start this quest, you talk to Canatilla, though this won't help you find her, as to start with, she's labeled rather mysteriously with just three question marks and no quest marker. While the Melusine can be rather mysterious and often say strange and shocking things normally, Canatilla's open remarks really take the cake for me. At first, she explains that she's standing in the middle of a tiny waterfall to strengthen her mind through meditation, though she admits she only read that that's what you should do when faced with unanswerable questions in a book. She then comments that the Traveler and Paimon are a very strange human and a rainbow balloon. When pressed further on this, she tries to explain further and for some reason, her response gave me goosebumps in a very uh, Silent Hill 3 sort of way. You feel excited when you step on them and snuff out their lives. Are you talking about the monsters? Monsters? They look like monsters to you? <laughs> they look like monsters to you? She says this. Interesting, but to my eyes, Paimon is just like a little rainbow balloon floating in the air and her string seems to extend upward to somewhere beyond the sky itself. And then about the Traveler. What I see, if I really must say, then I see a monster that looks like it could swallow the whole world in a single bite. Of course I'm serious. Perhaps you've heard that we Melusines can see things that humans cannot see. But for some reason, I see things differently even when compared to other Melusines. I can always find things that have been hidden. I have read that the nature of things is hidden beneath them, and this nature decides their future. Not that I know what that means. She goes on to say, As long as I spend enough time with everyone, I can grasp the concepts that everyone talks about, and then pretend to fit in. If you hadn't looked special in my eyes at all, I wouldn't have struggled to find the right concept to describe you. As I thought, it seems I still have lots to learn. What is a name but an artificial code that confers false uniformity on different perceptions? Still, everyone calls me Canatilla, and you may do so as well. This entire conversation struck me as so strange, I just sat there on the last line staring for several minutes. 
It invokes the image of Paimon as a puppet of Celestia, or of whatever force actually exists beyond the firmament, and the Traveler as a world devourer. We know a little bit about the Melusine and their origins thanks to the Ancient Colors questline. If you've seen my long, rambling red string on a corkboard video about Honkai Impact 3rd's connections to Genshin, then you know I have a lot of thoughts about Honkai Impact 3rd's Project Arc and the Flame Chasers, specifically with regard to Griseo, the young painter who was almost certainly the person sent out on the Ark into the wider universe in order to find a world that could resist or live without any Honkai disasters. I talk in that video about the likelihood that she could have very well been the primordial one, having brought the literal Ark with the human genome to Tevat, but that's obviously another video. I only bring her up here because the way that the Melusine in general speak about colors and how they experience the world is honestly creepily reminiscent of the way she does. She's extremely impressionable, and she takes on the color, personality, and traits of nearly anyone who stays around her very long. Recent developments in Honkai Impact 3rd's storyline might completely bring the Project Arc theories to an end, or even confirm them, as Griseo herself is going to be featured in the next leg of main story over on that side of the Hoyoverse, but we'll have to wait and see exactly how that pans out before making any more big conclusions. With what we currently have in-game with regard to Elinus himself, we can extrapolate that he was unleashed on Fontaine at the time of the Calamity in Conria 500 years ago. When we speak to him directly towards the end of the Ancient Colors questline, we find out that he was called out of a cold, empty void by the person he calls Mother, and given many brothers and sisters whom he loved because he was no longer lonely. The way he speaks of Mother and the timing of the Great Naval Sea Battle with Elenus is no mistake. It's highly likely that he was unleashed at the same time that Durin, one of his brothers, darkened the skies of Mondstadt. Hey, Albedo, you're an uncle, and your nieces are simply the most adorable creatures in all of Tevat. Inadvertently, this also proves, or at least props up, one of my theories about Durin as well, that Rhine Daughter did not create him, but summoned him from somewhere and then did something to him to turn him abyssal. We find out that Elenus's blood and tissue was also highly corrosive to humans, and when he was slain shortly after the Calamity, the government of Fontaine completely cordoned off the island he was beached on. The researchers from the Narcissan Crew's Ordo even mention that their experiments on Rift Wolves and expeditions to Dragonspine, from which they retrieved some Scarlet Quartz, confirm that Elenus is composed of the same stuff as both Rift Wolves and Durin's corrosive blood. We also, rather disturbingly, find out that a member of the Narcissan Crew's Ordo, named Jacob Ingold, made a full transformation into something identical to an iniquitous Baptist after consuming Elenus's flesh and blood, likely in his desperation to stave off an encroaching incurable illness that had stricken him while also helping with Renee's experiments. It's important to note that despite this form he takes, he does not bear any allegiance to the Abyss and suggests that they're primitive religious zealots that he has no interest in. If nothing else, this gives us the precedent for intelligent abyssal life that is not aligned with the Abyss Order at all. In another pretty direct story beat link back to Honkai Impact 3rd's Dr. Mobius and mirroring the plight of the Flame Chasers and the apocalypse they faced, the Narcissan Crew's Ordo had seen a prophecy of an impending apocalypse and decided that the only way humanity could survive was by transcending humanity, becoming a new life form altogether. René de Petricor spearheaded this project, and Jacob followed along with him without a second thought. Jacob's transformation succeeded, but there was another former member of the Institute who was instead warped into something horrific and inhuman. Jacob mentions that the reason he thought his own transformation succeeded was that his body was the same as that of the Sacred Lotus he once investigated in the Girdle of the Sands, suggesting that he had once encountered and done research with René and their group on the Harvest Stokum. What exactly was meant by this remains to be seen. Is it a matter of genetics or something more magical? As we now know that the Sacred Lotus is the body that anchors the remaining consciousness of Agiria, the first Hydro Archon, to this world. Why would their body's constitution be the same as hers, while the man they were traveling with, Carl Ingold, who is Jacob's adoptive father, was different from them? What makes them different from other natives of Fontaine? So, all of these things, at the very least, need to be understood in order to explain what happens in this questline with Canatilla, the strange Melusine. 
After the bizarre chat where she calls the Traveler a world-swallowing monster and alludes to Paimon's string stretching to somewhere above the heavens, she explains that she found a book left behind by a great scholar, later revealed to clearly be Jacob and or Renee, and has been puzzling over its contents for some time. She also says that everything she had said before she learned from his books. Supposing that Traveler and Paimon are outsiders and might know things she does not, Kenatilla invites them to have a look at the strange tome in hopes that they might be able to decode what she's failed to so far. Paimon then warns that arcane secrets that are encoded like that are probably not meant to be known, but talks herself out of her own warning when she thinks there might be treasure involved. Kenatilla takes the two to the cave where the books are after using the token she was born with, as all Melusines seem to be born, to open a solid rock into an underwater passage. The text here was interesting because the token is described as being key-like and makes a soft chime when she draws a line on the rock with it. Because of this, I wonder if the token is not in fact a key in the musical sense, as in likely a relic of Remuria, as it even plays a chime when she does this. If that's the case, that makes at least two Melusines from the village who have tokens that are Remurian musical implements. So, you go with her into this cavern and find a book on a stand surrounded by a glowing purple magical array that is more or less the same as the ones on the overworld in that same area that summon mobs of rift wolves to fight. Upon gazing at the book for a while, first, the strange characters seem to reorganize themselves so that you can understand them, and then something else happens. It's as if the whole area shifts and you find yourself somewhere else. Of course, this startles the Traveler, and he pulls back immediately, explaining what he saw. Kenatilla doesn't seem surprised. It seems that she, too, sees another place when she meditates on the text sometimes. Thus begins a long scavenger hunt for the rest of the pages, though the first one is one of the most interesting to me. The text reads, Read countless volumes here. It appears that these books were left behind by an ancient order. Kingdoms rise and fall. And when a civilization is annihilated, a new one will be born after from the ashes, which these books refer to as Fortuna. It's somewhat rudimentary, but theoretically at least, it bears striking resemblance to the computational scheme I have formulated and termed World Formula. All the records are blurred with age, but were I able to quantify them to some extent, they could be of use in my World Formula calculations. No matter how many times I derive it, the result remains the same, though this result is not expected. Unlike the world depicted in these ancient texts, there will be no more new civilizations born unless we consider introducing variables from outside the system. If it was that sort of power, there might be a chance. Here, I found the magical techniques left behind by the Golden Troop. They seem to be referred to by various names, but I'll go with this one for now. Based on my interpretation, it appears to be known as the Seal of the Chemical Marriage, and consists of two parts. However, it has been weathered too much to decipher any more information. Interestingly, I have encountered similar symbols in documents from the Narcissan Cruise Institute archives. They look complicated, yet the underlying principles are quite clear. If the records prove accurate, there are some key locations within the realm remaining. Related records may be found elsewhere as well. I should record my findings here for now, as they may prove useful in the future. This text made my brain race about a million miles per hour, because I actually read a lot of text about Kabbalah and magic in my edgy teen goth phase. I recognize the diagram as the Sephiroth, sometimes called the Tree of Life, but there's something weird about it. The cross at the bottom with triangles surrounding it isn't normally included in the diagram, so I puzzled over it for a while, and it suddenly dawned on me that it was a very simplified Rosencruz, a rose cross. This is another symbol associated with Kabbalah, but specifically with the borrowed, edited for Europeans Christian version, aka Rosicrucianism. The founder of the Rosicrucian order was Christian Rosencruz, a legendary, possibly fictional alchemist, who lived during the Reformation in Germany. The Rosicrucian manifestos were written in Germany during this time. The Rose Cross is a cross with a rose at its center, often red, golden, or white. 
Despite the cross on Jacob and Renee's diagram being simple, I think it has to be a reference to this symbol, as it's the only cross that's associated with Kabbalah, from which the main part of the diagram comes from without a doubt. It symbolizes the teachings of a Western esoteric tradition with Christian tenets. Basically, we want to be cool wizards, but please don't accuse us of heresy. We're totally cool with the J-Man, we swear. Please don't inquisition us. The Rose Cross is also perhaps more recognizably associated with the Golden Dawn, the order of the famous madman Aleister Crowley, and his Thelema system, and occasionally can be found used by followers of Genshin Impact's favorite system to borrow from, Gnosticism. I lean towards this being a direct lift from the Thelema Crowley system due to the presence of the four arrows on each end of the cross, a reference to their inclusion of symbols to represent the four classical elements. It's of note that Genshin's world also has a classical elemental system aside from the seven elemental system we know in-game from prehistory, as mentioned in the Byakuya Koku collection, but it has more than four elements, earth, water, fire, wind, ether, and void. Though ether and void make six, the other four are the basic elements, as used in pretty much every western school of magic, but wind is usually just called air. The Narcissus Flower comes up again in the 4.1 world quest, Villains, which sees you help a treasure hoarder trying to recreate a potion known as Pure Water, which comes from a legend about a researcher who, during the reign of the former Hydro Archon Egeria, sequestered himself in the countryside. At his hermitage, which overlooks an evocative space just out of bounds with a big, deep hole in a flooded area in the direction of Celestia, he poured out all of his potions, only to find a pool that Agiria had created from them, as she didn't want his many years of hard work to be in vain. Mirroring the story of Narcissus in Greek myth, he became enraptured with his own reflection in the magical waters and eventually fell in and drowned. Whether or not this has any direct connection to the Narciss and Cruz Ordo, and this story is yet to be seen, but I don't think it's an accident that the same flower and therefore same myth are being referenced again. Hopefully, this quest gets a continuation or at least plays into the larger story. It also mirrors some of the dialogue in the Anne of Narciss and Cruz story with lots of talking about princesses and knights. Another possibility is that this potion maker may have been one of the members of the Ordo, and I just didn't make the connection. Back to the tome itself. The seal of chemical marriage mentioned here is yet another reference to Rosicrucianism, specifically the chemical wedding of Christian Rosencruz, which in and of itself references the sacred marriage of Hermeticism and alchemy. This book appeared in circulation in Germany in 1616, but no single author is credited. According to Wikipedia, it is an allegoric romance divided into seven days or seven journeys, like Genesis, and recounts how Christian Rosencruz was invited to go to a wonderful castle full of miracles in order to assist the chemical wedding of the king and queen, that is, the husband and the bride. This manifesto has been a source of inspiration for poets, alchemists, and dreamers through the force of its initiation ritual with processions of tests, purifications, death, resurrection, and ascension, and also by its symbolism found since the beginning with the invitation to Rosencruz to assist in this royal wedding. Now, we know that Rene and Jacob found the secret of the Golden Troop from the ancient kingdom of Remuria. The Golden Troop were the four most loyal servants of the realm, given the god king Remus' power as if he were trying to imitate the primordial one's creation of four shining shades that carried out his bidding in perfect perpetuity. Of course, like every other civilization that attempted such a thing, Remuria was wiped off the map in what is pretty clearly a retelling of the myth of Atlantis. The ruins of the Golden City are said to lie on the seabed somewhere in Fontaine, so I hope we get a chance to explore them at some point. This secret of the Golden Troop, I assume, is what Jacob and Rene derived this world formula from. He speaks of introducing new variables from outside the equation, likely a reference to our good old friend, Forbidden Knowledge, the Abyss itself. These findings were what lead them to the conclusion that consuming Elenus's flesh and blood stood a chance of imparting this thing they sought, if the host could withstand it. I'm working on an audiobook compilation of all of the fragmented text in the book so far. We're missing page 10, which does not seem to be in-game yet, likely for a continuation of this quest, so if you want the full context, keep your eyes out for that. For now, I want to wind us back to the premonition of the end of the world that Jacob was fixated on. One of the first and closest pages you can find is located on the overworld map part of Elinus, and I gasped out loud when I approached the area. Though I had crawled all over that island, I hadn't stumbled on this place yet. 
I know for certain I would have recognized the architecture immediately. This is the only place in all of Fontaine that I've seen ruins that were not Remurian. It was only a small space, a hallway inside of a cavern, but it is undeniably the same architecture we all know well, first seen when we first set foot in Enconomia for the first time. This was a unified civilization ruin. I knew at that moment that this quest was about to finally, finally give me something to work with. After you've gone back to Kenatilla, decoded a few pages, you find yourself drawn into an actual domain and explorable area simply called question mark, question mark, question mark, just like Kenatilla when you first met her. Entering this space brought my hype up to basically uncontrollable levels. You enter into a dark space that is described rather ominously. Once again, you focus upon meditating, and the furor surrounding you fades. The world grows silent. Then, you hear the tiniest of sounds, and a feeling that is wrath, or perhaps grief, wells up within your heart. Your very soul feels drawn to this mysterious sound, and as you follow that sound, a whole world, utterly alien, supremely familiar, races to meet you. It's unclear just what kind of space this domain is, but it's interesting in the fact that you still see the normal overworld in your minimap. Technically, you're still exactly where you were, and you move around the map of Elenus as you explore the space, unlike entering most other instanced areas, which gives you a blank minimap. The main focus here is tailing Kenatilla as she seems to skip happily through the eerie, ruined landscape without a care in the world, unable to hear you when you call out to her. But I hardly noticed that as I was looking at every detail, every nook and cranny. Of course, the first thing that I realized was the fact that, again, this was unified civilization architecture. Paimon says that she assumes the writer of the book you've been reading must have created this space, so... Why does Jacob Ingold and Rene Petricor's vision of the future, the apocalypse, seem to consist of ruins made up of this specific architecture? Here, I'll try to bullet point all the things I thought were important to note. First, I think it bears mentioning that this place bears a striking resemblance to Honkai Impact Third's Sea of Quanta. The shape of the crumbling path is even the same. Explaining the Sea of Quanta is another video. Keep an eye out for my rambling dissertation on Numa and Ushia coming soon, for more on that. But it's a chaotic space in the greater Honkai universe. Reminder that it's confirmed by Word of God, developer commentary, that Genshin's Teyvat is a part of the greater Honkai universe and is a world like any other on the branches of the imaginary tree. The Sea of Quanta surrounds that tree, and it's where worlds that have been cut from the imaginary tree fall and inevitably dissolve into nothing but fragmented data to be recycled by the imaginary tree all over again in a familiar endless samsara. This makes it a pretty apt place for a world experiencing an apocalypse to be located. Next, if we look up, well, it's impossible not to. The sky was the first thing that drew my attention. It was strikingly similar to Fischl's domain from back in her Golden Apple Archipelago event. First off, the second, the obvious. The night skybox tinged pink and shattered as though something had shot through it, revealing a swirling vortex that I think evokes the same thought for just about everyone. The sinking feeling that that is not the heavens above, but the abyss. Could this be a glimpse of the true sky? The hidden truth of Tevat? That the heavens are not the heavens at all, but the abyss. I thought about this long and hard. The Book of Sun and Moon says that when the second throne of the heavens came, the earth was rent and the heavens rent asunder. And we all know the popular Tevat is upside down theory, right? What if whatever is above the sky, the place associated with Celestia, is not celestial at all, but has been abyssal all along? If Tevat is upside down, wouldn't that mean that Celestia is the abyss and the abyss is Celestia? One could certainly interpret it that way. We also see the same twisted white tree roots that appear in Enconomia, but I've always thought those must be connected to Erminsel and the withered white trees somehow. Looking in the distance, we see a small tower that seems to have been bisected, the top half flipped upside down like the upside down city in the chasm. And it isn't the only thing that connects this space to the chasm specifically. This one made my hair stand on end. I saw it entirely by chance. You spawn into the area in front of a glassy, violet portal that you might not even notice if you don't look behind you. At first, I thought it was a mirror reflecting the space we were in, but as I swung my camera around, it suddenly dawned on me. I knew the place in that reflection, and it wasn't a reflection at all. It's the fountain from the center of the upside-down city in the chasm. 
If you've done Danesliff's interlude quest in the chasm, you know that the Abyss attempted to cure the curse laid on the people of Conria using the water from the fountain to disastrous results. As soon as I thought about it though, the way the water in the fountain looked was burned in my brain, and it made me think. Was that another artifact out of time? Was that fountain perhaps water from the primordial sea? The implications of that could be any guess. It was simply what came to mind as I thought, why choose that specific static image out of all of the others they could have used? They could have made that portal a dark swirling mass with a few glimmering starlights in it like all the other portals in the area, but they chose not to. It's definitely significant. They wanted us to remember that specific place, that fountain, now that we're in Fontaine. Overall, the architecture is the same as Enconomia, the same as the Upside Down City, but I did notice these strange sconces. At first, I thought they were likely coral-shaped, like an Enconomia, but on closer examination, I think they're just white branches. At the end of the path, at the top of the inverted tower, you fight a rift wolf that then seems to transform into a harmless dog, and you find another page that says this. See that? That's the conclusion the world formula arrived at after countless calculations. The scene we foresaw, the destruction after the cataclysm, and this world where not even a sweet flower or a mint can grow. That is the end of all things. Do you believe it at last? Whether you have arrived at this place via the Book of Revealing or the Looking Glass, lend me your strength that we may avoid this future. Just as I said, the only way is... This seems to suggest that the Narciss and Cruz Ordo's world formula was used at least in part to calculate the inevitable outcome of the world, like scientists run simulations to understand the inevitable heat death of the universe. Fitting, since the diagram drawn to represent it is the Sephiroth, the world tree. But at this point, I was confused. If this was an inevitable end of the future, why was all of the architecture and assets down to the books and scrolls scattered about all copies of the ruins of the unified civilization? Through my understanding of this, I came to one conclusion. Jacob Ingold and Rene de Petricor gambled everything and threw it all away on a mistake. What if the apocalypse they saw wasn't coming? It had already happened. All at once, like I'd hit a rewind button on a VHS tape, my mind screeched back to Enconomia, the chasm, and the unified civilization under the primordial one. There was another page, you see, that had stuck out to me when I'd been decoding them. In page 3, Renee mentions that the Rift Wolves had the exact same properties of Elenus, creatures of the Abyss. Page 6, though extremely fragmented, is also deeply intriguing. In the expedition to Petricor and the ruins before, we discovered Origin. It seems that compared to humans, we, if, all return to transcend, although intellectual and counterintuitive, the ancients succeeded before. Most of the remaining content cannot be deciphered due to the thoughts expressed being utterly incoherent. Page 8 is much longer and a bit convoluted, but mentions retrieval of a sword that is a key. It does not belong to anyone, and it just travels from one hand to the next. The wills of countless people be concentrated. Necessary materials and rituals. This line reminded me a lot of concepts in Honkai Impact 3rd, from Divine Keys to Project Stigma. These ideas expressed are repeated in a lot of Hoyoverse's flagship games for sure, though I don't know exactly what relevancy there is to that connection. Rene goes on to write that he's searching for an ancient seal, and once again I stopped and had to reread several times because I just got too overexcited at this line. It basically just boils down to a kind of extremely effective witchcraft that takes advantage of the origin, the primordial. Based on the records, the constituent element should be a circle of four orthent and a tree of emanation. I think, of course, this is likely referring to the primordial sea rather than the primordial one, but along with the fact that the two must be somehow related, Either possibility is intriguing, but I'd probably just lose my mind if we find out these guys somehow access something directly related to the Primordial One. Then again, maybe the Primordial Sea is something that is exactly that. As for the Circle of Four Orthents, well, Orthents is a mathematical term referring to dimensions. Usually it deals in three dimensions, but if it's a Circle of Four, well then we're talking about literal 4D chess here. As for the Tree of Emanation, huh. There are too many magical trees in Genshin to choose from, however- I 
think that maybe, just maybe, since the Sacred Lotus, that is also more or less the source of the Amrita, was already referenced by them, that that might be what they needed or chose to use here. This is further suggested when they mention a slate replica they found that corroborated their findings about the apocalypse. I assume, since their former investigations before they focused on Elenus, mostly revolved around the desert that they might be talking about the stone slate from Deshert civilization. Note, you can find machines from Deshert civilization littering the Institute of Natural Philosophy that they were also members of and used to do many of their experiments. Page 8 goes on to say, We arranged for members of the society to visit several candidate locations. We should be able to find traces of water and channels of higher quality and density. This is just hilarious now. The secrets of the ancient civilization so carefully guarded. What a joke. Turns out we've already been through the same countless times in our youth. The next fragment that's really interesting is in page 11. Shall be the passageway between the primordial and the present. Deconstruct and reverse its utility and internalize. Use to fully master. Matrimony of chemistry, bonding of the elements, circular ruins, forest in the mirror. Send Lyris and Jacob to... Some of these pages are just a doozy, one after the other. This, I assume, had something to do with the space they created that you're pulled into. In reality, it's anybody's guess. Again, this passage referenced the chemical marriage and mentions bonding of the elements, which is just... We don't know what that means, but it could be crazy. When you finally find Canatilla and ask her why she wasn't responding while she wandered through the ruins, she explains that she was walking through a lovely sunny forest filled with huge, beautiful flowers, the stark opposite of what you saw. A world where, as Jacob and Renee wrote, not even a mint or a sweet flower could grow. On first hand, you might think that this is just because Melusines see everything differently than humans, but page 11 and the page found at the top of the upside down tower give it away. There are two ways to reach this space, the book and the looking glass, and the two things are associated with Lyris and Jacob. If you've done the Anne of Narciss and Gru's world quests, the name Lyris should be immediately familiar. Lyris is the mythical princess of the storybook tale and make-believe that Anne, the Osinid, is playing out. And after I finished the Book of Esoteric Revelation quest, I realized the two quests were intrinsically linked and needed to understand each other. It's through the little ocean and Anne story that we can decode the deranged ramblings of Jacob and Renee and start to understand what actually happened to these people. We know that the true leader of the Narcissan Cruz Institute was actually an Osinid, and as Anne is the only other walk folk mentioned, we can assume that the Osinid was in fact Lyris. This explains why Anne and the other characters in her plot believe that Princess Lyris was taken by the evil dragon they call Narcissus. Paimon says the image of the dragon that appears, a gargantuan, building-sized oceanid, doesn't look anything like a dragon. If Lyris is the oceanid, then why would they believe that she had been taken by it? The answer is this. René de Petricor used the director's body as the base of his plan to merge the consciousness of all Fontanians, what he considered the best plan to escape the coming apocalypse. He ended up dissolving himself and several others into this eldritch horror Osinid, effectively stealing away the young Osinid Anne's beloved Lyris, who Anne was told to protect. This, I believe, is why their make-believe evil dragon Narcissus takes the form that it does. I touch on this because the mention of the forest in the mirror is also significant. It is a place you can visit towards the end of Anne's journey. Inside of this looking glass is the true Anaposis. Anne, Paimon, and the Traveler encounter an obviously oceanid person who calls herself Marianne. Over the course of their conversation, the three realize that not all is as it seems, and the Traveler deduces that the entire adventure they had experienced was all a story, one presumably based on the original Marianne's life experiences, including her days of play-acting at the Narciss and Cruz Institute. After they realize this, the false Marianne sends them away, telling them that her story has already ended. Marianne has all of the hallmark appearances that mark a person as an Osinid copy of an original person. 
For now, we don't know what happened to the master this eldritch Osinid Renee created after it was defeated by Marianne and her brother Elaine Guillotine when they faced off against Jacob and the master inside of Elenus. One theory is that Marianne, who died in the battle, was dissolved and absorbed by the Osinid, and her current form may mean that she is what's left of the master or an offshoot created from it. So, for some reason, Canatilla sees Marianne's forest in the mirror rather than the circular ruins when she enters the Book of Esoteric Revelation. The other thing that this quest really hit me with was something that took me once again back to the Byaki Okoku collection and before Sun and Moon. We know that Byaki Okoku sank underground during the fighting between the Primordial One and the Second Who Came. They maintain that the Primordial One must have won the fight though this has been widely the subject of debate in the community. I was thinking on this and realized that the people of Byaki Okoku were able to confirm this when they first tried to leave the underground. Our ancestors sought the returning way, for surely the war on the surface had ended by then, but the Primordial One, the First Throne, had laid down a ban preventing our ancestors from finding the path home. In that case, the Primordial One must have defeated the Second Who Came. Reading this again, I feel like that is rather decisive, and why wouldn't they know if Istaroth, one of the Primordial One's shades, was among them? They could have just said, well, we couldn't find a way out, but it is recorded rather explicitly that they had been banned by the Primordial One from returning to the surface. This must have been instantly recognizable to them upon their attempt to return to the surface, or to Istaroth herself who would have then told them that that was the case. I think back to the Flower of Paradise Lost artifact set, which still feels like the biggest lore bomb of all time, where Malikata said, Just as the prophecy left by their goddess foretold, even after the scouring of civilization, humanity yet survives by their tenacity. It was a faraway time of calm and peace. Divine envoys spoke openly with the people then, bringing them the word from the heavens, but in time, invaders descended from beyond the firmament, bringing with them destruction, overturning rivers, spreading plagues. And though the invaders brought war to my former kin, they also brought about illusions that could break through the shackles to the land. But the master of the heavens, consumed by fear for the rising tide of delusion and breakthroughs, sent down the divine nails to mend the land, laying waste to the mortal realm. In Before Sun and Moon, the followers of the Primordial One all speak of how the heavens helped humanity and how humanity was the Primordial One's most beloved creation. This, I think, is why so many still think that there's some sort of switcheroo going on. But Nabu Malikata, one of the eldest gods ever to exist, former envoy of the Primordial One itself, states clearly that the Divine Nails were sent down to lay waste to the mortal realm, out of the Master of the Heavens' fear. We can pretty much assume that the Master of the Heavens and the Primordial One are one and the same by way of deduction. The invaders that came from beyond the sky brought disasters, but also brought illusions that could break through the shackles to the land. If the second who came, the invaders, had won, then they would have no need to fear their own power or order. The Master of the Heavens was, however, described as being consumed by fear for the rising tide of delusion and breakthroughs. These were the things the second who came brought. To me, that just says outright that the Primordial One won the battle, but also changed, did a 180. Its beloved creation had been tainted and had to be cleansed. This harkens back to all of the talk about how humans were fated to give in to sin from the beginning in Before Sun and Moon. It also has some obvious biblical references to the story of Noah's Ark tied in that have been mentioned by myself and many others when talking about the book Before Sun and Moon. Putting this together with the vision of Jacob's Apocalypse, which I believe was a vision of the past instead, it dawned on me the true tragic scope of it all. Enkonomia was a tragedy of its own kind, but it was the only civilization we knew from that time period for a long time. It was easy to imagine this one city sank, and surely the rest of that unified civilization just continued on until new ones came about. I thought something similar in the chasm, Oh, the solar chariot, likely just a nail, crashed here. We don't really know why. Surely not. And then, according to Kapatsir, the Thunderbird of Tsurumi Island, multiple nails dropped on Tsurumi Island. It now seems that we can corroborate a timeline that these nails all dropped around the same time, when the second who came brought the first knowledge from outside of Tevat, 
and during the Forty Year War between them and the Primordial One, that knowledge was in some way or form spread to the humans of the newborn Tevat. And now, thanks to the 4.1 Archon Quest's ending, we have another perspective on this. Up until now, aside from Apep's rage, a quiet simmering anger boiling for millennia, we've only had the text of the Byakuyakoku collection and inferences to think of who and what the Primordial One was. Even a character like Nuvalet, who we know as a neutral but deeply caring being, describes the Primordial One as the usurper who came from outside. My own personal theories coming to fruition about the nature of the Gnosis and the Archon's authority being ripped away from the original Seven Sovereigns was pretty triumphant for me. All this time, most of us have thought of the Primordial One as the rightful original god of Tevat and the second who came as the interloper. But from the beginning, alien forces have been toying with this world, war after war fought in a desperate bid to claim Tevat's unique power. For now, we can only speculate on the meaning of this strange place, marked only question mark, question mark, question mark. It's suggested to be a literal representation of the end of the world, a place that Jacob Ingold and René de Petricor somehow glimpsed and set them on their twisted, doomed path. Perhaps of the most concern is the fact that Jacob is still alive, the only surviving neo-human from René's deranged experiments that we're sure of. My predictions are hinging pretty heavily now on learning the truth about the Primordial Sea. What did they mean by saying the Primordial Waters would one day stop giving birth, that all would return to them? Is this the Fontanian prophecy rehashed, or something bigger and more sinister? Now in Fontaine, I also remember the other prophecy, that the Sovereign of Water would be reborn in the body of a human. Knowing now that this is without a doubt Nuvalet and not Kokomi like I and many others considered a serious possibility, I mean, maybe we'll still get an explanation for her Bishop constellation and other things in her kit, or maybe it's simply a representation of her lineage and just a red herring. I wonder if we'll see her in the story again soon, as I don't think her appearing in the Fontaine-related summer quest this last year was just a coincidence, but who knows. I wonder if any of the original Sovereigns survived the First War, like Apep, but from what Nuvalet said, that all of the living Sovereigns no longer retain their full dragonhood and would not be able to do so without an Archon returning their authority, that maybe that doesn't matter. If even something as massive and terrifying as Apep can no longer be considered a true dragon, then what does that amount to for the future? I have a ton of thoughts on this, but I think I'll save it for another video that will serve as an update to my thoughts on the Dragon Sovereigns in general. I get the feeling that the answer to these and so many questions are just around the corner. I'm so ready to be excited again. Thank you for listening. It's great to be back with you, Hex and Zirkle Initiates. This is, as always, the Hex and Zirkle, signing off. I hope you join us on our next adventure. <laughs>